In this slide set, slide set, I'm going to speak about perinatal infections, and I'm going to feature HSV as sort of the poster child for perinatal infections. The specific learning objectives are to review the most common presentation of neonatal HSV infections, to list the most common vertically transmitted infections, both viral and non-viral, and to discuss strategies to prevent infections in the fetus and newborn infant. You may recall from the springboard video the case of a baby who contracted neonatal herpes from an infected mother around the time of delivery. The baby uh, presented with skin lesions which were unrecognized, went on later to develop seizures, which ultimately was a result of an HSV infection. Unfortunately, the diagnosis was missed, and therefore treatment wasn't given, and the baby ended up with uh, substantial disability, and it resulted in a lawsuit. Some general comments about neonatal HSV infections. Uh, usually, meaning over 90% of the time, these infections are contracted from exposure to the virus being shed by the mother at the time of delivery. About half of the time, the mother's infections are resulting from a primary, that is a first uh, time infection in the mother, and about half the time, they result from a recurrent infection in the mother. The, there are three classic clinical presentations of neonatal HSV infections. One involves a skin, eye, and mucosal membrane, referred to as SEM, a second disseminated, and a third involving the central nervous system. SEM is the most common form of neonatal herpes. Uh, of all babies who have neonatal herpes, 40% present with this skin, eye, and mucosal involvement. They typically present between one and two weeks of age, although skin lesions, as demonstrated in the picture uh, on this baby's forehead, may be present as early as a delivery room. The skin lesions are often associated with conjunctivitis. It is very important when one sees a baby with vesicular lesions to consider herpes and to undertake rapid diagnostic testing. For example, performing a DFA, a direct fluorescent antibody, on uh, a sample of the vesicle fluid because if the diagnosis can be made and the treatment initiated, the baby will do well. If, on the other hand, the diagnosis is not made, uh, the baby may progress to a more severe form of infection. In addition to the rapid diagnostic tests, obtaining cultures from skin lesions and eye discharge is recommended. The second form of infection, representing about 25% of cases, is disseminated infection. Babies typically present during the first week of life, and for all intents and purposes, they look as if they have a bacterial uh, septic infection. Uh, that is, they present with sepsis, they often have severe liver dysfunction, and because they cannot make coagulation factors, they have a severe coagulopathy and they hemorrhage, and they may have respiratory distress because of involvement of the lungs. If there are no vesicles present, um, it may be uh, difficult to think of herpes. You must have a high index of suspicion. You must, you must have in your mind herpes in addition to bacteria. The infection, uh, you try to diagnose it by culturing the baby from as many sites uh, as you can access, such as the nose, the mouth, the vagina, the rectum, the skin, and so forth. This picture shows the three most common places that disseminated herpes likes to go in a newborn or other compromised host. The liver, showing acute yellow atrophy. The lung, which I admit is quite subtle, is meant to show pneumonia. And the brain, which, can which in a newborn can be severely destroyed from this virus with a bad encephalitis. The third form of neonatal herpes is CNS involvement. This represents about a third of all cases, and it's the latest in age of onset of presentation, typically occurring between the second and third week of life. The baby presents with lethargy, irritability, fever, uh, and has seizures. Seizures in a baby of this age, you must consider herpes. A, a lumbar puncture would be obtained, and CSF should be analyzed by PCR uh, to see if any herpes is present. Uh, the, there is a typical EEG abnormality in these babies, and neuroimaging, either CT scan or MR, 
will show, as in the top picture, severe destruction, or in the bottom picture, some temporal lobe involvement, although this picture is not from a newborn. Finally, neonatal infection may be congenital in type, which means it's acquired in utero, typically probably during the first uh, trimester of pregnancy. Uh, this is not common. It represents less than 5% of all cases of neonatal infection, the other 95% acquired around the time of delivery. The largest series of patients with neonatal herpes was published in 1987 and involved 13 babies who had the clinical features listed on this table, the most prominent of which was skin lesions and scars at birth, as demonstrated in the picture on the right. There are a number of other viruses that can be transmitted vertically from mother to baby, either in utero, causing true congenital infection, or perinatally. This table depicts these viruses and tries to illustrate the relative frequency between in utero acquisition, for example, low with herpes, versus perinatal acquisition, high in herpes. And the other viruses are there uh, for your perusal. In addition to viruses that may be transmitted vertically, there are non-viral agents that may be transmitted vertically. Toxoplasmosis, syphilis, group B streptococcus and listeria, tuberculosis, malaria, and even the cause of Lyme disease may be transmitted from mother to baby. Some have referred to these uh, especially congenital infections as the TORCH infections, uh, where TORCH stands for toxoplasmosis, other, where you can put everything else, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes. Uh, some call it STORCH to try to be cute, to illustrate uh, carried in by the, by the STORCH, where S is syphilis. I'm not a big fan of this mnemonic uh, because not all of the infections in STORCH or TORCH are acquired in the same way. For example, the rubella uh, may be acquired either congenitally or perinatally, and as I've emphasized, a herpes is more often acquired perinatally. Prevention of fetal and neonatal infections is an important consideration, and there are three broad strategies. One is to vaccinate mothers so they don't contract the infection during pregnancy and transmit it to their baby. A second is to treat uh, diagnosed infections that may be transmitted from mother to baby, treat them during pregnancy or at delivery. And a third is avoidance during or after delivery. Vaccination is certainly the best, but there are a limited number of vaccines relevant to the prevention of vertical infections, and they're listed on this slide, and all persons in North America are vaccinated against rubella, hepatitis B, the chickenpox vaccine, VZV, and papillomaviruses. So these are vaccine preventable, but they don't represent most of the uh, perinatal infections, for example, herpes. With regards to prevention using treatment during pregnancy or at delivery, there's a two-step process here. One is you have to diagnose the infection occurring during pregnancy or at delivery and then provide the treatment. Syphilis, all pregnant women are screened for syphilis at least once during their pregnancy. If they're infected with syphilis, they are treated during their pregnancy and then tested for cure. Group B streptococcus, a bacteria that used to be the most common cause of neonatal sepsis, is now often prevented by screening mothers in the last trimester of pregnancy and treating them at the time of delivery if they are known to be carriers of group B strep. And this has caused a marked reduction in vertical transmission of group B strep infection. Diagnosing HIV in a pregnant woman will lead to antiretroviral therapy for the woman and then her newborn that effectively prevent many infections caused by HIV. And for places where toxoplasmosis is especially a problem, such as in France from eating undercooked meat during pregnancy, screening for toxoplasmosis and treatment may be effective. And the final methodology for preventing fetal and neonatal infections is avoidance during or after delivery, if possible. And I underscore here herpes, uh, as we've talked about before, because it's mostly an infection acquired from an infected mother at delivery, if 
the contact with the virus can be avoided, for example, through cesarean section, that may be a strategy that's effective, although it has limitations, uh, which we will discuss at another time.